So that is very frequent. So what begins to be intrinsic in all of this is the notion that language shapes the way you think. And this harks back to a grand old theory in linguistics and language acquisition in two guys early in the 20th century, Sapir and Worf, and the Sapir-Worf hypothesis being that language constrains thought that your capacity for thinking, the way in which you think, is constrained by the language that you have been taught, the language you speak, and that has been debated endlessly in terms of just how much evidence is there for that versus how much the style of thought shape what the language is. This has endlessly been debated and it's one of the sort of hallmarks of what linguistics is about. In the last decade, two populations, two traditional populations in the Amazon that were studied that are viewed as giving really major support for a strict superior wharf notion that your capacity for thought, the nature of your thought, is deeply shaped, potentially deeply constrained by language. So these two tribes, the one, the first is called the Paraha, and the other is called the Mandruku, I believe. And what you have in both of them is a very different number system than we have, than virtually every westernized society does. In the first group, the Paraha, their number system consists of three numbers. One, two, and something bigger than two. In Munduruku, it's essentially the same thing, but it's five terms. It goes up to six terms, one, two, three, four, five, and all other numbers that are bigger than five. And I don't know completely what that suggests about how often you have to count stuff down there, but what it suggests is this is going to be a very different relationship with numbers, and what they show, studies with these folks, is doing mathematical uh, computations, doing estimates, doing everything in the second tribe with numbers up to five, the exact same level of accuracy as would a westernized individual. But get above five and accuracy goes down the drain. Somebody in that society has a huge amount of trouble telling the difference between six objects and eight objects eight objects and ten on because they all get bucketed as how many are there it's the number that means more than five and in the first group you see the same exact thing for any number above three there's a lot of trouble being accurate distinguishing three from four from five and so on because they all have the same term they are that number that is bigger than two all of that occurring once you get above those numbers guesses essentially at the chance level so that's kind of impressive and very interesting, but maybe there's always this potential kind of uh, counterinterpretation as to what's happening there, which is maybe these are not terribly sharp folks there, and maybe have had all sorts of issues with protein malnutrition or cerebral malaria or God knows what. No, because in each of these populations, each of these cultures, they know thousands of different types of edible plants and medicinal plants. These are enormously sophisticated people in those realms. Numbers just aren't a big deal. And what you see is somebody growing up in that society who has not invented the language, but are instead acquiring it, it constrains their ability to tell the difference between the numbers three and four. Very shape shaping in that regard. So all sorts of people debating endlessly how much does language shape the way you think, how much does thinking shape the sort of language you come up with. But at the end of the day, there's this whole sort of philosophical business that no matter how similar the language is that you're using with someone else, it's going to mean something slightly different to you. And thus you have the flip side to our ethology soundbite. Ethology is interviewing an animal, but it's an own language. Sort of the flip side, a quote once, the effect of, if you could interview a lion in its own language, you wouldn't have a clue what it was talking about. Because communication is so intertwined with mind, with values, with meaning, all of that, that it would essentially be inaccessible. And you hear about people who are multilingual. How many of you are pretty adept at a second language? Third language? Any hands up there? Whoa, OK. So those of you who are really comfortable in multiple languages, 
Do you find you have different emotional, emotive styles of communicating when you're switching languages? Do you tend to have more expressivity in one of them? Do you tend to be more analytical, whatever? Okay, I'm going to pretend that there was just hundreds of faces going up and down agreeing with that stance because that's a well-known fact based on years of teaching Bio 150. Yeah, languages serve different functions and different emotions and different cognitions very intertwined and at a true extreme interviewing somebody in their own language even if it is the same language that you ostensibly share with them you're not quite going to be speaking the same language. <laughs>